screwed up. Alright, hopefully this thing's working right and everything will work smoothly here. I'm going to try to make it through this reading. Thank you for joining me for another reading on the Freemasonic Knowledge Channel. Uh, tonight's reading, and, and bear with me, uh, got a little bit of the Chemtrailonitis. Uh, here in Detroit, been pretty heavy. Last two fronts have moved in within the uh, 72 hours of each other, and of course they spray heavily before each front, and uh, I can always tell in my throat and lungs. So, uh, I'll try to make it through this as smoothly as possible. Another note, if you're just joining me, and uh, you're, um, how do I put this? Okay, basically, I'll let you know up front, this reading is for the hardcore. Okay, this is for hardcore researchers. If you're not a hardcore researcher and you or you don't have any knowledge already of previous research, then you're going to be totally lost on this article most likely. And it is a long article. Like I said, we try to make it through in one reading, one sitting. And it, um, but it's very long, very detailed. It has a lot of words in it that I'm not even sure I can pronounce. And so I'm just giving you fair warning uh, so you don't waste 10 minutes of your life before you decide you don't want to hear anymore. Uh, you know, and especially on this one, if you're not going to stick with it, then don't even start it. It's not worth it. Uh, so, anyway, I mean, like I said, if you're not a, a hardcore researcher, you won't understand half this stuff anyway. So, anyway, with that said, um, I will begin. And... Tonight's reading here is The Roots of Ritualism in Church and Masonry by H. P. Blavatsky. And this is part one of two. And we have uh, uh, January 1920, reprinted from Lucifer, volume four, from March of 1889. <coughs> Like I said, excuse me, I got my cup here, and I'm going to try to do this as smooth as possible, but I do have a, a little bit of chemtrailonitis today. <coughs> okay, excuse me, folks. Okay, this, this, and it's from the, the <laughs> let's see, I can't even pronounce nothing. Okay, Theosophical Publishing House, and Adair, Madre, Madras, 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 and in India. Uh, Adair Madras, India, probably Adair Madras in, is probably places in India, I guess, or some, I don't know for sure. I've never heard of the, those first two places, so. Go figure. Theos, theosophists are very often, and very unjustly too, accused of infidelity and even of atheism. This is a grave error, especially with regard to the la la latter charge. In a large society composed of so many races and nationalities, in an association wherein every man and woman is left to believe in whatever he or she likes, and to follow or not to follow, just as they please, the religion they were born and brought up in, there is but little room left for atheism. As for infidelity, it becomes a misnomer and a fallacy, to show how absurd is the charge in any case it is sufficient to ask our tra traducers to point out to us in the whole civilized world that person who is not regarded as an infidel by some other person belonging to some different creed whether one moves in highly respectable and orthodox circles or in so-called heterodox society it is all the same it is a page two mutual accusation tactically if not openly expressed a kind of mental game a, at shuttlecock and battle door flung reciproc reciprocally and in polite silence at each other's heads in sober reality then no theos theos theosophist any more than a non-theosophist can be an infidel while, on the other hand, there is no human being living who is not an infidel in the opinion of some sectarian or other. As to the charge of atheism, 
it is quite another question. What is atheism, we ask, first of all? It is, is it disbelief in and denial of the existence of a god or gods, or simply the refusal to accept a personal deity on the somewhat gushy definition of uh, R. Hall, who explains atheism as a ferocious system because it leaves nothing above us to excite awe nor around us to awaken tenderness. If the former, then most of our members, the hosts uh, in India, Burma, and elsewhere, would demur as they believe in gods and supernatural beings and are in great awe of some of them, nor would a number of Western theosophists fail to confess their full belief in spirits, whether spatial or planetary, ghosts or angels. Many of us accept the existence of high and low intelligences and of beings as great as any personal god. This is no occult secret. Most of us believe in the survival of the spiritual ego in planetary spirits and nirmanakayas, those great adepts of the past ages who, renouncing their right to nirvana, remain in our spheres of being, not as, page 3, spirits, but as complete spiritual human beings. Save their corporeal, visible envelope, which they leave behind, they remain as they were in order to help poor humanity as far as can be done without sinning against karmic law. This is the great renunciation indeed, an incessant conscious self-sacrifice throughout aeons and ages till that day when the eyes of blind mankind will open and instead of the few, all will see the universal truth. These beings may well be regarded as God and gods, if they would but allow the fire in our hearts at the thought of that purest of all sacrifices to be fanned into the flame of adoration or the smallest altar in their honor. But they will not. Verily, the secret heart is fair devotion's only temple. In, in, in any other, in this case, would be no better than profane ostentation. Now with regard to other vi invisible beings, some of whom are still higher and others far lower on the scale of divine evolution, to the latter we will have nothing to say. <laughs> the former will have nothing to say to us, for we are as good as non-existent for them. The homogeneous can take no cognizance of the heterogeneous. He heter Hetron, heterogeneous, heterogeneous, you know, huh, uh, you know what it is. Okay, <laughs> and unless we learn to shuffle off our mortal coil and commune with them spirit to spirit, we can hardly hope to recognize their true nature. Moreover, every true theosophist holds that the divine higher self of every mortal man is of the same essence as the essence of these gods, being page 4, moreover, endowed with free will, hence having more than they, responsibility. We regard the incarnated ego as far superior to, if not more divine than, any spiritual intelligence still awaiting incarnation. Philosophically, the reason for this is obvious, and every metaphysic metaphysician of the Eastern school will understand it. The incarnated ego has odds against it which do not exist in the case of pure divine essence, unconnected with matter. The latter has no personal merit, whereas the former is on his way to final perfection through the trials of existence, of pain and suffering. <clears throat> the shadow of karma does not fall upon that which is divine and, un 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 and unalloyed, uh, and so different from us that no relation can exist between the two. As to those deities which are regarded in the Hindu esoteric pantheon as finite, finite, finite and therefore, uh, I, I better slow down a little bit, huh? And sorry, folks. Okay, and therefore, under the sway of karma, no true philosopher would ever worship them. They are signs and symbols. Shall we then be regarded as atheists only because, whilst believing in spiritual 
hosts, those beings who have to be worshipped in all their collectivity as a personal God, we reject them absolutely as representing the one unknown. And because we affirm that the eternal principle, the all-in-all, all, or the absoluteness of the totality, cannot be expressed by limited words, nor be symbolized by anything with conditioned and qualificative attributes, shall we, moreover, permit to pass without protest the charge against us of idolatry by Roman Catholics of all men, they, whose religion is as pagan as any other of the solar and element worshippers, whose creed was framed out for them, cut and dry ages before the year one of the Christian era, and whose dogmas and rites are the same as those of every idolatrous nation? If any such nation still exists in spirit anywhere at this day, over the whole face of the earth, from the north to the south pole, from the frozen gulfs of the northland to the torrid plains of the southern India, from Central America to Greece, and Chaldea to the solar, fly <laughs> and the solar fire as symbol of divine creative power of life and love was worshipped, the union of the sun, male element, with earth and water, matter, the female element, was celebrated in the temples of the whole universe. If pagans had a feast commemorative of this union, which they celebrated nine months ere to the winter sol solstice, when Isis was said to have conceived, so had the Roman Catholic Christians. The great and holy day of the Annunciation, the day on which the Virgin Mary found favor with her God and conceived the Son of the Highest, is kept by Christians nine months before Christmas. Hence, the worship of the fire, lights, and lamps in the churches. Why? Because Vulcan, the fire god, married Venus, the daughter of the sea, that the Magi watched over the sacred fire in the east and the virgin vestals in the west. The Son was the Father, Nature, the Eternal Virgin Mother, Osiris and Isis, Spirit, Matter, the latter worshipped under each of these three states by pagan and Christian. Hence the virgins, even in Japan, clothed with star-spangled blue standing on the lunar crescent, were as symbolical of female nature in her three elements, air, water, and earth, fire, or the male sun, Ficundating, fissundating her yearly with his radiant beams, the cloven tongues like as of fire of the Holy Ghost. In Kalevala, the oldest epic poem of the Finns, of the pre-Christian antiquity of which there remains no doubt in the minds of scholars, we read the gods of Finland, the gods of air and water, of fire and the forest, of heaven and earth. In the superb translation by J. M. Crawford in Rune L. Volume 2, the reader will find the whole legend of the Virgin Mary in Marietta, Child of Beauty, Virgin Mother of the Northland, page 720. Uko, the great spirit whose abode is Yumala, the sky or heaven, chooses the Virgin Mariata as his vehicle to incarnate through her in a man-god. She becomes pregnant by plucking and eating a red berry, Marja, then repudi repudiated by her parents, she gives birth to a son immortal. In the manger of a stable, then the holy babe disappears. The Mariata is in search of him. She asks a star, the guiding, north, the guiding star of Northland, where her holy baby lies hidden. But the star answers her angrily, If I knew, I would not tell thee. Tis thy child that me created, in the cold to shine forever, and tells the virgin nothing. Nor will the golden moon help her, because Mariata's babe, having created her, left her in the great sky. Here to wander in the darkness, all alone at eve to wander, shining for the good of others. It is only the silver sun who, taking pity upon the virgin mother, excuse me, tells her, Yonder is thy golden infant, there thy holy babe lies sleeping, hidden to his belt in water, hidden in the reeds and rushes. She takes the holy baby home, and while the mother calls him Flower, the others named him Son of Sorrow. 
Is this a post-Christian legend? Not at all, for as said, it is essentially pagan in origin and recognized as pre-Christian. Hence, with such data in hand in literature, the ever recurring, ta recurring taunts of idolatry and atheism, of infidelity and paganism, ought to cease. The term idolatry, moreover, is of Christian origin. It was used by the early Nazarenes during the two and a half centuries of our era. Again, those nations who used temples and churches, statues and images because they, the early Christians themselves, had neither temples, statues, nor images, all of which they abhorred. Therefore, the term idolatrous fits far better our accusers than ourselves, as this article will show. With Madonnas on every crossroad, there are thousands of statues, from Christ and angels in every shape, down to popes and saints, it is rather a dangerous thing for a Catholic to taunt any Hindu or Buddhist with idolatry. The assertion has now to be proved. We may begin by the origin of the word God. What is the real and primitive meaning of the term? Its meanings and etymologies are as many as they are various. One of them shows the word derived from the old Persian and mystic term gada, which means itself, or something self-emanating from the absolute principle. The root word was gaden, which whence wotan, woden, and odin, the oriental radical, having been left almost unaltered by Germanic races, thus they made it of gots, from which the adjective gut or good as also the term gata or idol were derived. In ancient Greece the word Zeus and Theos led to the Latin deus. This gata, the emanation, is not and cannot be identical with that from which it radiates and is therefore but a periodical finite manifestation. Old Eratus, who wrote full of Zeus are all in all the streets and the markets of man full of him is the sea and the harbors did not limited his deity to such a temporary reflection on our terrestrial plane as zeus or even its antitype dias but meant indeed the universal omnipresent principle before the radiant god dias dias the sky attracted the notice of man there was the Vedic tad that which to the initiate and philosopher would have no definite name and which was the absolute darkness that underlies every manifested radiancy no more than the mythical Jupiter the later reflection of Zeus could Sur Surya the Sun the first manifestation in the world of Maya and the son of Dias failed to be termed father by the ignorant. Thus the son became very soon interchangeable and one with Dias, or Dias. It, it's pronounced kind of funny, like so. I'm not really pronouncing it right, but I'm just keep calling it Dias. So, but for some the son, for others the father, in the radiant sky, Dias Pitar, the father and the son, the son in the father truly shows, however, this finite origin by having the earth assigned to him as a wife. It is during the full decadence of the metaphysical philosophy that Dayava Prithvi uh, let me try that again Prithvi Prithvi there we go, okay, Dayava Prithvi heaven and earth or Prithvi Prithvi, Prithvi began to rep be represented as the universal cosmic parents, not alone of men, but of the gods also. From the original conception, abstract and poetical, uh, the ideal causes fail, uh, the ideal cause fell into grossness. Dian Dias, the sky, became very soon Dias, or heaven, the abode of the father, and finally indeed that father himself. Then the sun, upon being made the symbol of the latter, received the title Dinakara Daymaker, or Dinakara Daymaker, of Bhaskara Lightmaker. 
and the, and these are all Hindu terms. If you, I mean, if if you haven't figured it out yet, they're comparing. You know, they're rebuting. He's rebuting uh, Catholic accusations towards uh, Eastern religions, basically, and uh, in this section. So now the father of his son, and vice versa, and showing how they're they're all connected. It's all talking about the same thing. How all religions basically talk about the same thing. Uh, I, well, we haven't gotten that far yet, but I mean, it, that, they do. But anyway, uh, the reign of ritualism and anthropomorphic cults was henceforth established and finally degraded the whole world, retaining supremacy to the present civilized age. Such being the common origin, we have to but we have but to contrast the two deities, the God of the Gentiles and the God of the Jews on their own revealed word and judging them on their respective definitions of themselves conclude intuitively which is the nearest to the grandest idea we quote colonel ingersoll who brings jehovah and brahma parallel with each other the former from the clouds and the darkness of sinai said to the jews Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the inequities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Contrast this with the words put by the Hindu into the mouth of the Brahm. I am the same to all mankind. They who honestly serve their other gods involuntarily worship me. I am he who partaketh of all worship. I am the reward of all worshippers. Compare these passages, the first a dungeon where crawl and the things begot of jealous slime, and the other great as the domed, firmament inlaid with suns. The first is the God who haunted Calvin's fancy when he added to his doctrine of predestination that of hell being paved with the skulls of unbaptized infants, the beliefs and dogmas of our churches are far more blasphemous in the ideas that they imply than those of the benighted heathen. The amours of Brahma under the form of a buck with his own daughter as a deer, or of Jupiter with Leda under that of a swan, are grand allegories. They were never given out as a revelation, but known to have been the products of the poetic and fancy Hesiod and other mythologists. Can we say as much of the immaculate daughters of the God of the Roman Catholic Church, Anna and Mary, yet even to breed that the gospel narratives are allegories too, as they would be most sacrilegious were they accepted in their dead letter, constitutes in a Christian born an acme of blasphemy. Verily, they may whitewash and mask as much as they like the God of Abraham and Isaac. They shall never be able to disprove the assertion of Marishon, who, or, yeah, or Marcion, Marcion or Marcon, who denied the God of hate, or who denied that the God of hate could be the same as the Father of Jesus? Heresy or not, but the Father in heaven of the churches has remained since then a hybrid creature, a mixture between the Jove of the pagan mobs and the jealous God of Moses, exoterically the Son, whose abode is in the heaven or sky, esoterically. Does he not give birth to light that shineth in darkness to the day, the bright dais, dais, the sun, and he, and is he not the most high, dais, colium? See, I, I, I now I recognize that the actual is dais, uh, and I can recognize the Latin. I don't really recognize that spelling with the Y in there, but anyway, Dias, uh, Deus uh, Colium, or Coulum, sorry, and it is not again Terra the Earth, It is, is it not again Terra the Earth, the ever immaculate as the ever prolific virgin who for Sunday, fecundated, fecundated, I don't know that word, by the ardent embraces of her Lord. 
and fructifying rays of the sun becomes in this terrestrial sphere the mother of all that lives and breathes on her vast bosom hence the sacredness of her products in ritualism the bread and the wine hence also the ancient messes the great sacrifice to the goddess of harvests uh, serious illusion uh, and the earth again same thing messes for the initiates misa for the profane uh, from pro before and phantom the temple uh, phantom the temple the non-initiates who stood before the fane but dared not enter it see uh, vid the works of Ragon, now transformed into the Christian mass or liturgy. Uh, liturgy. Uh, the ancient obla oblation of the fruits of the earth to the sun, the Dies Alt Altissimus, mo the Most High, uh, the symbol of the G A O T O goat <laughs> of the Masons to this day. Okay, so uh, let me read that again more smoothly there. Uh, the ancient oblation of the fruits of the earth to the sun, the Deus Altis Altissimus, the Most High, the symbol of the goat of, to, of the Masons to this day, become the foundation of the most important ritual among the ceremonies of the new religion. The worship offered to Osiris and Isis, the sun and the earth, the earth and the moon its parent were interchangeable thus all the lunar goddesses were also the representative symbols of the earth vide the vid the secret doctrine symbolism to Baal the and the cruciform astarte uh, of the babylonians to odin or thor and frigga of the scandinavians to belin and the virgo part Paratura of the Celts uh, to Apollo and the Magnamata, Magnamata of the Greeks. Uh, all these couples having the same meaning, passed bodily to wor and were transformed by the Christians into the Lord God or Holy Ghost descending upon the Virgin Mary. <sighs> okay. De Deus, Deus Sol or Solus or the high sun the father was made interchangeable with the sun the father in his new glory he became the sun at sunrise when he was said to be born this idea received its full apotheosis annually on december 25th during the vernal solstice when the sun hence this of the solar gods of all nations was said to be born Natalis Solis Invicte, and the precursor of the res resurrecting sun grows and waxes strong until the vernal equinox, when the sun's soul begins its annual course under the sign of the ram or lamb, the first lunar week of the month. The first of March was feasted throughout all pagan Greece. And, and you have to remember, too, March is actually the first month. We're not talking about January here. March is the first month. February is the last month. Uh, there's a great video that I put up a few, couple years ago on my other channel uh, called Surface Dwellers that Galactic Wacko made. And uh, that talks about the uh, manipulation of the calendar within that video, along with a couple other things. Anyway, so, I mean, that's what they're talking about here. The first of March is the first of the year. That is the beginning of the actual year in the real calendar. Uh, not the Roman calendar that uh, most people go by here in America now. Um, so just to clear that up, uh, the first lunar week of the month, the first of March was feasted throughout all pagan Greece as its Neomena was sacred to Diana. Christian nations celebrate their Easter for the same reason on the first Sunday that follows the full moon at the vernal equinox with the festivals of the pagans and the canonicals, can canonicals of their priests and hierophants uh, were copied by Christendom. Will this be denied in this life of Constantine? Eusebius confesses the same, perhaps the only truth he ever uttered in his life, that, and I quote, 
in order to render Christianity more attractive to the Gentiles, the priests of Christ adopted the exterior vestments and ornaments used in the pagan cult. He might have added their rituals and dogmas also. <clears throat> it is a matter of history, however unreliable the latter, for a number of facts preserved by ancient writers corroborate for a number of facts preserved by ancient writers corroborate it that church ritualism and Freemasonry have sprung from the same source and developed hand in hand. But as Masonry, even with its errors and later innovations, was far nearer the truth than the church, the latter began very soon her persecutions against it. Masonry was, in its origin, simply archaic Gnosticism or early esoteric Christianity. Church ritualism was and is exoteric paganism, pure and simple. Remodeled, we do not say reformed. Read the works of Ragon, a Mason who forgot more than the Masons of today know. Study, collating them together, and the casual but numerous statements made by Greek and Latin writers, many of whom were initiates, most learned neophytes, and, uh, and partakers of the mysteries. And, and, that, and that's what this, I'm glad he brought that in because I've been wanting to insert that. It, all this that he's talking about is Mystery Babylon religion. Okay, the sun worship, Mystery Babylon, the mysteries, when they say the mysteries, that's what they're referring to, is Mystery Babylon. So understand when reading this um, that this is this person's point of view and his article, okay, does not make it truth or fact in everything he says. He is just uh, basically going over, he is going over true history and true belief systems. Um, so just keep that in mind and that's what we're talking about here is the mysteries and ba a mystery Babylon read finally the elaborate and venomous slanders of the church fathers against the Gnostics the mysteries and their initiates and you may end up unraveling the truth it is a few philosophers who driven by political events of the day tracked and persecuted by the fanatical bishops of early Christianity who had yet neither fixed ritual nor dogmas nor church it is these pagans who founded the latter, blending most ingenuously the truths of the wisdom religion with the exoteric fiction so dear to the ignorant mobs. It is they who laid the first foundations of ritualistic churches and the lodges of the modern masonry. The latter fact was demonstrated by Ragon in his anti of the modern liturgy compared with the ancient mysteries. And showing the rituals conducted by the early Masons, the former may be ascertained by a light comparison of the church canicles, conicles, canonicals, the sacred vessels, and the festivals of the Latin and other churches with those of the pagan nations. But churches and masonry have widely diverged since the days when both were one. If asked how a profane can know it, the answer comes, Ancient and modern Freemasonry are an obligatory study with every Eastern occultist. Masonry is paraphernalia and modern innovations, the biblical spirit in it especially, notwithstanding, does good both on the moral and physical planes, or did so hardly ten years ago at any rate. Since the origin of Masonry, the split between the British and American Masons and the French Grand Orient of the Widow Sons is the first one that has ever occurred. It bids fair to make of these two sections of Masonry a Masonic Protestant and a Roman Catholic Church, as far as regards ritualism and brotherly love, at all events. It was a true ecclesia in the sense of fraternal union and mutual help, the only religion in the world. If we regard the term as derived from the word religar, to bind together. Lig oh, religare. Religare. 
yeah, regular, regular is to bind together, regular <laughs> in English, um, as, as it made all men be belong in it to it brothers, regardless of race and faith. Whether with the enormous wealth at its command it could not do far more than it does now is no business of ours. We see no visible crying evil from this institution and no one yet, save the Roman Church, has ever been found to show that it did any harm. <laughs> Can church Christianity say as much? Let ecclesiastical and profane history answer the question. For one, it has divided the whole mankind into Cain and S Cain's and Abel's. It has slaughtered millions in the name of her God, the Lord of hosts, truly the ferocious Jehovah Sabbath. And instead of giving the impetus, 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 sorry, <laughs> get, I, I'm still thinking about these statements he just made about the Cain's and Abel's. Okay, we already have uncovered the secret here in the modern age of the Cain's and Abel's, and we realize it's DNA, and that there actually is a difference between the Cain's and Abel's. DNA wise uh, of course this is written damn near a uh, hundred years ago um, so uh, or better what yeah anyway uh, almost a hundred years ago 1920 so uh, but it was you know recopied from the the book Lucifer so that kind of tells you a little something about its origins of this whole article that we're reading here period you know maybe the point of view um, so but anyway uh, the Lord of hosts and, and, and notice the the uh, author, he's talking about how pay, how the church has corrupted and, and, and paganized itself. And then he goes on to uh, quote, but then he goes on to quote the uh, church and uh, the beliefs of the church in the Old Testament sense. Okay, with the, the ferocious, the jealous God, the je et cetera, et cetera. And, and not the new... Uh, not the new sense in the New Testament, the after Jesus, okay? Because that's the whole thing, man. And and yes, there's a, there's actually two different gods, but I'm not going to get into that because that's up to personal beliefs. But um, you know, we call them gods, whatever you want. Label them. Labels are another thing that you can get over uh, once you reach a certain uh, realization of reality. Anyway, it's like calling black, white, white, black. Does it change the color? No, I can call it whatever the heck I want. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't change the fact or the color or the reality or the truth, uh, no matter what label I place to it. So, that bottom line on that, that's that's my point on that. So, let me continue here. And instead of giving impetus to civilization, the favorite boast of her followers, it has retarded it during the long and weary medieval ages. It is only under the relentless assaults of science and the revolt of men trying to free themselves that it began to lose ground and could no longer arrest enlightenment. Yet, has it not softened as claimed the barbarous spirit of heathendom? We say no. <laughs> most em em emphatically it is churchianity with its odium theology uh, the theologicum since it n could no longer repress human progress which infused its lethal spirit of intolerance its ferocious selfishness greediness and cruelty into modern civilization under the mask of cant and meek christianity when were the pagan Caesars more bloodthirsty or more cruelly cruel than are the modern pontins, pontin, pon, potentates, pontins, I know how to, pontins, <laughs> and their armies, pontins, pontins, I know how to pronounce that word, I just can't right now. Uh, when did the millions of the proletariat, uh, proter, proletariat, that's right, the first time, starve as they do now? When has mankind shed more tears and suffered than at present? Uh, yes, there was a day when the church and masonry were one. These were centuries of intense moral reaction, a transitional period of thought as heavy as a nightmare, an age of strife. Um, obviously, this person is very happy of the separation of masonry and church and uh, blames the Roman Catholic Church for all the world's woes, as do many others 
Thus, when the creation of new ideas led to the apparent pulling down of the old things and the destruction of old idols, it ended in reality with the rebuilding of those temples out of the old materials and the erection of the same idols under new names. It was a universal rearrangement and whitewashing, but only skin deep. History will never be able to tell us, but tradition and judicious research do. How many semi-hierophants and even high initiates were forced to become renegades in order to ensure the survival of the secrets of initiation. Praetextus, proconsul at Achaia, 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 is credited with remarking in the fourth century of our era that to deprive the Greeks of the sacred mysteries which bind together the whole mankind was equivalent to depriving them of their life. The initiates took perhaps the hint, and thus joining Nolan's Volans in the followers of the new faith, and then becoming all domineering, acted accordingly. Some Hellenized Jewish Gnostics did the same. <laughs> Hellenized. Uh, not as in hell like hell, but Hellenized. Anyway, yeah, that, uh, another story. And thus more <laughs> than one Clemens Alexandrinus to convert to all appearance the ardent Neoplatonist Platonist and the same philosophical pagan at heart became the instructor of ignorant Christian bishops. In short, the convert Mag uh, I'm not even gonna try that. Magrir Louis blended the two external mythologies, the old and the new, and while giving out the compound to the masses, kept the sacred truth for himself. The kind of Christians they made may be inferred from the example of Synesius, the Neoplatonist, uh, Platonist, Platonist uh, this, uh, what scholar is ignorant of the fact or would presume to deny that the favorite and devoted pupil of Hypatia, Hypatia the virgin philosopher, the martyr and victim of the infamous Cyril of Alexandria, had not even bapti been baptized when first offered by the bishops of Egypt of the Episcopalian See of uh, Ptolemaid or Ptolemaid? Tomade? Tomade is the silent P. Okay, I get it. Tomade. Uh, every p student is aware that when finally baptized after having accepted the office proffered, uh, preferred, it was so skin deep that he actually signed his consent only after his conditions had been complied with and his future privileges guaranteed. What the chief clause was is curious. It was sine qua non condition. Sine qua non condition that he was to be allowed to abstain from professing the Christian doctrines that he, the new bishop, did not believe in. Thus, although baptized and ordained in the degrees of deaconship, priesthood, and episcopate, he never separated himself from his wife, never gave up his platonic philo philosoph philosophy nor even his sport so strictly forbidden to every other bishop. This occurred as late as the 5th century. Such transactions between initiated philosophers and ignorant priests of Reformed Judaism were numerous in those days. The former sought to save their mystery vows and personal dignity, and to do so they had to resort to a much to a much-to-be-regretted compromise with ambition, ignorance, and the rising wave of popular fanaticism. Basically, these individuals that had power, they wanted their cake and eat it too. That's, that's an easy way of saying that. <laughs> uh, they believed in divine unity, the one or solace. Okay, and, and, and let me do something here, because he keeps... Com the one and solace are two different things, okay? Back in, back here, back in these days, that's when they combined them as one. That was the whole point of of, of the statement of saying, uh, you know, no sun wash up and, 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 and do not combine the idolatry with me and do not combine the sun wash up with me. Do, you know, this is the creator. This is the, the true one, the true creator, the divine creator, okay? And it is not solus, the sun. Yet this author keeps referring to them both as the same, just because 
in the time period and references that he is speaking and, and for this knowledge. And just to clear that up real quick. Okay, unconditioned and unknowable. And still they consented to render public homage and pay reverence to Sol, the sun, moving along among his twelve apostles, the twelve signs of the zodiac. <coughs> Excuse me, alias, the twelve sons of Jacob. The whole hoi poloi, remaining ignorant of the former, worshipped the latter, and in them their old time honored gods. To transfer that worship from the solar, lunar, and other cosmic deities to the thrones, archangels, dominions, and saints was no difficult matter. The more so since the said Sidriel dignities were received into the new Christian canon with their old names almost unchanged. Thus, while during Mass, the Grand Elect reiterated under his breath his absolute adherence to the supreme universal unity of the incomprehensible workmen and pronounced in solemn and loud tones the sacred word, for now substituted by the Masonic word at low breath, his assistant proceeded with the chanting of the Kyriel of names of those inferior sidereal beings whom the masses were made to worship. To the profane Katsuman, indeed, who had offered prayers but few months or weeks before to the bull Apis and the holy Sinophilus, El phallus. Let's just say phallus. That's what it is. Okay, it's to the sacred uh, Ibis and the hawk-headed Osiris. St. John's eagle, it is an error to say that John the Evangelist came, became the patron saint of masonry only after the 16th century, and it implies a double mistake. Between John the Divine, the seer, and the writer of Revelation, and John the Evangelist, who is now shown in company of the eagle. There is a great difference, as the latter John is a creation of Irenaeus, Irenaeus, along with the fourth gospel. Both were the result of the quarrel of the Bishop of Lyons with the Gnostics, and no one will ever tell what was the real name of the writer of the grandest of the Evangels. But what we do know is that the eagle is the legal property of John, the author of the Apocalypse, Apocalypse, written originally centuries B.C., and only re-edited before receiving canonical, canonical hospitality. This John or Owns was the accepted patron of all the Egyptian and Greek Gnostics who were the early builders or masons of Solomon's temple, as earlier, of the pyramids. From the beginning of time, the eagle was his attribute, the most archaic of symbols, being the Egyptian Ah, the bird of Zeus, the sacred to the sun with every ancient people. Even the Jews adopted it among the initiated Kabbalists as the symbol of Sephira, Tipereth, uh, Tipereth, it's a Tipereth, and the spiritual aether or air, says Mr. Myers Kabbalah, with, oh, says Mr. Myers Kabbalah. Now, with the Druids, Druids, the eagle was the symbol of the supreme deity, and again, a portion of cherubic symbol, of the cherubic symbol, adopted by the pre Christian Gnostics. It could be seen at the foot of the Tau in Egypt before it was placed in the Royce Croix degree at the foot of the Christian cross. Preeminently, the bird of the sun, the eagle, is necessar necessarily connected with every solar god and is the symbol of every seer who looks into the astral light and sees it in it the shadows of the past, present, and future as easily as the eagle looks at the sun. And the divine dove, witness of the baptism while hovering over the Lamb of God, must have appeared as the most natural development and sequence to his own national and sacred zoology, which he had been taught to worship since the day of his birth. It 
It may thus be shown that both modern Freemasonry and church ritualism descend in direct line from initiated Gnostics, Neoplatonists, uh, Pla Platonists, Platonists, and renegade hierophants from of the pagan mysteries, the secrets of which they have lost, but which have been nevertheless preserved by those who would not compromise. If both church and masons are willing to forget the history of their true origin, the theosophists are not. They repeat, masonry and the three great Christian religions are all inherited goods. The ceremonies and passwords of the former, and the prayers, dogmas, rites of the latter, are transvestied uh, copies of pure paganism, copied and borrowed as diligently by the Jews, and of Neoplatonic theosophy, also, the passwords used even now by biblical masons and connected with the tribe of Judah, Tubal Cain, and other zodiacal dignitaries of the Old Testament are the Jewish aliases of the ancient gods of the heathen mobs, not of the gods of the hierogrammatists, the interpreters of the true mysteries. That which follows proves it well. The good Masonic brethren could hardly deny that in name they are so solid souls indeed the worshippers of the sun in heaven in whom erudite, erudite ragon saw s such a magnificent symbol of the goat which it surely is only the trouble he had was to prove which no one can that the said goat or gatu gotu gatu was not rather the soul of the small exoteric fry of the profanes than the solace of the high epitai. For the secret of the fires of solace, the spirit of which radiates in the blazing star, is a hermetic secret which, unless a mason studies true theosophy, is lost to him forever. He has ceased to understand now even the little indiscretions of sh sh Shudi to this day the Masons and Christians keep the Sabbath sacred and call it the Lord's Day yet they know as well as any as, as any that both Sunday and the Sonntag of Protestant England and Germany mean the Sunday or the day of the Sun as it meant 2,000 years ago and I want to put another thing here, but since they did bring up the Herm, uh, uh, the Hermes, uh, I'm going to when I post this, I'll actually include a couple extra links: uh, the Hermetic Order of the Sun uh, link, and uh, or the ed, uh, and uh, the other one is uh, or is the Hermetic Order of the Dawn. Sorry, and then the other site I will include in there is. Uh, well, I'll go ahead and include the Gnostic site too, but I'll include some links. So look for those links, and those will actually link you up to some excellent, excellent resource information to help you uh, understand and and learn more about about what this individual here is is talking about in all this. Um, so I'll, I'll include those in the in the description box. Um, <coughs> And you, reverend and good fathers, priests, clergymen, and bishops, you who so charitably call theosophy, idolatry, and doom its adherents openly and privately to eternal perdition, can you boast of one single rite, vestment, or sacred vessel in church or temple that does not come to you from paganism? Nay, to assert it would be too dangerous, in view not only of history, but also of the confessions of your own priestly craft. Now that is a statement. And I'm going to actually stop this here. We're going to make this in a couple of halves. Because I can see this is very long. And this will be a breaking point. So I thank you for joining me for this part one. Of the roots of ritualism in church and Masonic Order, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, and we'll be back. Please join me for part two.